Yes, we want to uh, bring into the conversation uh, right now uh, our friends, uh, Barbara Perry. Uh, she is the Director of Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, and our friend Andrew Oak, uh, who we relied on just yesterday when this news broke, uh, and you've written extensively on America's First Ladies, the First Ladies Man yourself. Uh, thanks so much for being with us here. Um, you know, Andrew, I do want to start with you as well. You and I were talking on Friday when we got the news uh, Rosalind Carter had entered hospice care and just two days later passing away there uh, at her home in Plains, Georgia. And so many tributes have been pouring out, uh, not only you know from residents there in Plains, but former presidents, former first ladies as well. When you got the news, what went through your mind? Well, it was it was sadness, of course. Everyone is sad at this loss. It's a great loss, but more of celebration, I think, in my heart. Uh, I'm celebrating the love story that was the Carters and continues to be the Carters, the life of of public service, selfless public service, and and two strong individuals. The Carters did what the Carters wanted to do, and they were always humble about it and very gracious about it. But they were also um, they they were not forced to do anything. They weren't uh, uh, loudspeakers for anything they didn't believe in. And you know, we think back even in months of hospice care and Mrs. Carter openly. Uh, revealing that she was uh, had dementia before she was in hospice. Just two months ago in September, we saw them, part of the Peanut uh, Festival parade, going down Main Street in Plains, the town that that's, loves them to this day. I have so many friends and so much family there, Carter and Smith family that I'm in contact with. My first response was to immediately uh, message the family members who I'm close with and let them know that my deepest heartfelt thoughts and condolences and wishing peace for the family, but let them know that I would be celebrating the life of this incredible woman. Yeah, of course, uh, like David Spunce said in his report, Barbara, we do have more details uh, about the funeral arrangements. Of course, we're going to get through the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, and then they begin Monday. They go through Wednesday as well. Her funeral Wednesday will be at the Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, of course. They were so instrumental uh, with that church community there in Plains, Georgia, for their entire lives. Uh, but when you talk about her legacy as well, uh, and you talk about Jimmy Carter, who went into hospice in February of this year, and I would argue has just really defied the odds. Uh, he did make it to his 99th birthday, October the 1st. But, Barbara, how are you feeling? What are you kind of remembering today, 24 hours later? Mm-hmm. My memory takes me back to 1977, January the 20th, a freezing cold day in Washington, inauguration day for Jimmy Carter to become the president of the United States and for Rosalind, his wife, to become first lady. And already as a college student studying political science, one of my bucket list items at that time was to attend a presidential inaugural. So that happened to be the first a president for whom I voted and I hopped on a train and went from Louisville, Kentucky to frozen Washington. The Potomac River was frozen over. And I'll never forget going from the back of the Capitol where inaugurals were held in those days, running around to the other side, the mall side of the Capitol and seeing Jimmy Carter, the new president and the new first lady, Rosalind Carter, walking hand in hand down Constitution Avenue and then to Pennsylvania Avenue. And we now take for granted that at least for part of the parade route, that the president and so far his wife uh, will walk at least a portion of that. But here, Jimmy Carter and, and young Amy, their youngest child and their sons and daughters-in-law were all marching down from the Capitol to the White House. And what I think about when I, when I think in my mind's eye of that and see my, my Kodak camera uh, portrait of it is that they were making a change from the Nixon years and Watergate and yeah. particularly for what came to be called the Imperial Presidency. They were of the people and that's how I will remember both of them. You know, Andrew, you have written so extensively about America's first ladies. And I would argue, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, that, you know, her tenure, her legacy as First Lady is somewhat, you know, underrated, where she didn't play the traditional role of White House hostess. She was an advisor to her husband, sitting in on cabinet meetings, talking about 
the issues of the day, very heady issues, worldwide global issues. This was a really fraught time, not only in the United States, but worldwide as well. They called her steel magnolia. She loved politics, Andrew, did she not? No, she very did and was very intelligent, highly intelligent from a young age. She was valedictorian of her high school class there in Plains. Uh, as a, as even a, a junior high or younger student, she got straight A's and got, I think it was $5 reward from one of the local uh, um, uh, uh, hardware stores there in town from a local business owner. Um, so a, a very smart, a very intelligent, stepping outside of traditional roles. She was on the girls basketball team in Plains, Georgia. So she takes this all the way up to the campaign when Governor Carter needed to be introduced to the world, to the nation at, at first. And she headed up the peanut brigade right out of the train depot there in Plains, Georgia, you know, in the package you showed beforehand, standing in front of that strip mall there, that historic strip mall in Plains, there's a train depot just to the right of that place, um, that, that strip mall there with all the stores, which was the campaign headquarters, which was where President Carter accepted the nomination with friends and family members. And there she's been at his side the whole time, stepping outside of traditional roles, uh, being that uh, campaign advocate, going door to door, the grassroots, and then in the White House, as you mentioned, sitting in on cabinet meetings, advisory meetings, what she did in the White House, and then even more importantly, carried on after. It's a one-term presidency. You can only do so much in four years or eight years even. And then you step outside of that and you look at what she did basically on her own with her husband supporting her causes with mental health, the different yeah. foundations, the different uh, um, uh, seminars, the different the different organizations that she was part of and sat as, as honorary fellows and part of the, uh, she even worked with it with a, uh, a mental health journalism contingency to help promote this. She didn't just, just put her name on something. She got involved all the way. And that's just one of the issues that she got involved with. One of the causes, one of the things, not to mention the world peace, not to mention women's rights, women in the Constitution, women's leadership, unemployment, uh, uh, impoverished people, people that uh, hu uh, Habitat for Humanity, right. all the different causes where she wasn't just a, a figurehead. She wasn't just a face or a name on something. She went all in and saw those causes as, as far through as she humanly could have possible. I honestly, I, I don't know where she had the time, the energy, and that long life to put in all of this, all of these efforts. It's just, it's it's Herculean. It's truly un, unprecedented and, and remarkable and to be remembered. Yeah, and, and Barbara, to that point, uh, and when you talk about the political nature of Rosalind Carter, she had to convince not only the state of Georgia, but the rest of the country uh, that James Earl Carter Jr., uh, the pride of Plains, was worth voting for. I mean, he was a political unknown. He had hardly any name recognition when he burst onto the political scene. You know, that was what, 1975, 76, and then of course, though, in 1980. They didn't take the loss very well, but they came back from it. Uh, and to Andrew's point, the post-presidency, you could argue, uh, was more fruitful, uh, if not, you know, more fruitful th than their actual four years in the White House, the good that they did. Uh, and so I've just been thinking of that, but they did take the loss very, very hard, didn't they? Well, it would be a, a rare president and politician and first lady who would be defeated for a second term yeah. and not take it hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, most people, all human beings want to win. And if you rise all the way to the White House, you certainly have a winning streak going. So I, I don't I certainly don't blame them for taking it hard. They did. But it, it's also OK to say. And in fact, I think it's accurate. And it's also to their credit that they overcame that. And that, as we've said, the, the model that they created for a post presidency and a for a post first ladyship uh, is uh, now the model. And we are seeing pictures of them. I love to see pictures of them in their hard hats, building homes for Habitat for Humanity and traveling around the world and all of the items that uh, Andrew has ticked off this evening. It is the case that they have been so involved up until their, uh, their health has just failed in recent years. But I, I think that any president and any first lady who can come out and create this new model of what it means to be a public servant uh, they deserve every accolade that has come to them. You know, Andrew, when you talk about this love story, this marriage that lasted for 77 years, you go back 
you know, to the brief statement President Carter put out yesterday, you can argue that, you know, a part of him died yesterday. They were so inseparable. And the beginning of their love story, Rosalind became close to one of Jimmy's sisters, Ruth Carter, later engineering a date between the two. Of course, Rosalind was, was a little younger than, than Jimmy, though. Uh, and so you talk about that. That's just one for the history books, is it not? Their love story, how long they were married, how long they were together. It really is. You know, in my studies for the C-SPAN White House Historical Association series, First Ladies, Influence and Image, and what I do as the First Ladies man is I try and avoid the presidents. I try and keep them out of the story. We know so much about them. We study them. There's books about them. We've had enough of them. Not to take anything away from what they've done, I focus on the ladies. It's almost impossible to separate Rosalind Carter from President Jimmy Carter. Uh, apparently, Miss Lillian, Jimmy Carter's mother, <coughs> excuse me, was in the delivery room when Mrs. Carter was born and present young Jimmy Carter was shown baby Lillian at a very early age. Miss Lillian was also the hospice nurse that helped Rosalind's father, Edgar, pass on there in the tiny house in Plains, Georgia, right around the corner again from that strip mall that we were showing earlier in Plains. And when Mr. Smith, Edgar Smith, Rosalind's father, passed away, Miss Lillian, Jimmy Carter's mother took young Rosalind out to be with her friends, Jimmy Carter's sisters, at the peanut farm, the, the Carter family farm. Uh, these two are entwined. They went to the same school together. They went to the same church. The, the Presbyterian church there in Plains is where uh, Jimmy asked Rosalind out on their first date. They, they, they were married in Plains. They taught Bible study up till very recently there yeah. at the church where Mrs. Uh, Carter will be memorialized next week. Uh, there, there's no President Carter without Rosalind Carter and vice versa, but they were also had the unique ability to have that combined power of two, but also give the other the 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 room to explore some of their own uh, uh, passions and 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 play that support role. It, it's it's truly legendary, and you see so many pictures and the video you're showing where they're holding hands in nearly every instance. Yeah. And I know because I've spoken with uh, one of the Carter's grandsons that they've held hands right up to the very end, and oh, it's wow. just a beautiful, sweet, sweet story. Yeah, and I was going to ask too. You know what? Have they been doing, uh, obviously both were in hospice as of yesterday, how have they been passing the time? Uh, and, and you know, I've been watching old interviews, Barbara, uh, and President Carter was asked about, you know, was winning the Nobel Peace Prize uh, the best moment of your life? Was winning the 1976 presidential election the best moment of your life? And no, he answers, when Rosalind said yes, that she would accept to marry me, that was the best moment of his life, which I thought was, was so interesting. I guess my question too, and I just wanna get your thoughts on this. I mean, do we think President Carter will be up and at him and able to be in attendance at all of these memorials next week? Of course, he's 99, he's in hospice himself, very, very frail. Andrew, do you have any reporting to suggest that? Well, I, I can tell you this, when, when President Carter first entered into hospice, one of the first calls I made was to to one of the one of the nieces and a friend that I have down in Plains. And she said that she had spoken to the family doctor and said, well, what does this mean for Uncle Jimmy? And he said, well, normally I'd say, you know, it's it's a couple of days, maybe a week. But this is President Carter we're talking about. And now here we are almost eight months later. And again, I can't stress the importance of this, this appearance of them in September at the Peanut Festival. This is two people, 99 and 96 years old, that both are, are, are suffering from medical issues, one mental and the other physical, in hospice care or just nearly in hospice care. And the Carters didn't go places in planes where they didn't want to go. But also the Carters were not kept from going places where they wanted to go. I know that COVID was very hard on two people so active in wanting to be out and part of their community that uh, it's just remarkable to see them this past September in that peanut festival parade. And while the president is not in good physical condition, it would not surprise me if he showed up to any or all of these events, yeah. um, but certainly he will be part of the, the personal and the private family moments there in Plains, Georgia. Yeah, of course, just what, uh, a couple of years back, there's that really iconic photo uh, of former president George H.W. Bush in a wheelchair, uh, looking uh, at the American flag draped coffin of his wife, former first lady Barbara Bush as well. I was thinking about that today. 
Um, but Barbara Perry, just uh, your final thoughts here. What will you be looking out for in the days ahead? I'll be looking out for the faith that and the values that brought Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter to the fore. And I'll be thinking about how their faith sustained them through that long marriage and their service and that they always believed. And I would like to believe that there is an afterlife and that they will be reunited there. All right. So we'll leave it at that. Great point to leave it at. Barbara Perry, Andrew Oak, thanks so much for joining us to remember Rosalind Carter tonight. Talk soon.